Can do it again. Okay, good afternoon, Steve. Good afternoon, Carla. Lovely to be with you. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us for um, this chat, chat this afternoon. So I understand that you're in your first week back of school after the school holidays? Yep, we've just started uh, term two. Awesome. And so here in New Zealand, we are in our second week of the school holidays. So uh, I'm imagining that we may have some teachers and hopefully lots of school leaders joining us with their feet up this afternoon uh, with a cup of tea in a sunny spot um, to listen into to your words of wisdom this afternoon. Hopefully all those no pressure. out there are uh, relaxing, yes. <laughs> I hope, hope I can be of help. <laughs> yeah, cool. So, Steve, I'll just uh, begin by sharing a little bit about you, if that's okay, and then we'll um, jump into uh, some of the questions that I've got um, drafted for our chat this afternoon. So, um, Stephen Cat is the principal of Bentley West Primary School in Melbourne, and... Uh, um, his school or the school Bentley West um, has become very, very well recognised both nationally and internationally for its adoption of evidence-based teaching practices, particularly in the area of reading and mathematics. Uh, Stephen has worked across the primary and secondary schooling sectors as an educational leader for the past 15 years. He has a Master's of, of uh, School Leadership from Melbourne University and has worked with schools um, and across Australia and bridging the gap from research to practice. And I know that it is something, Steve, that you are incredibly passionate about. Um, he has served on the expert advisory panel to the federal government for the year one literacy and numeracy checks in 2017. So welcome again, Steve. It is wonderful to have you and um, your perspective really on um, how we go about implementing evidence-based practices into, into our school settings to really ultimately raise the bar in literacy and um, numeracy or mathematics outcomes. So I'm just wondering if we could kick off perhaps with you telling us a little bit about um, the teaching approach that you have implemented at Bentley West and a little bit of, of the journey of, of how that came about, I guess, and how long you've been working to, to get to the point where, where you are now as, as being, you know, really um, highly regarded in this place of implementing such good quality education for all students who come to Bentley West. Again, uh, thanks for having me, Carla. And uh, yeah, it's been a, an incredible journey. And um, I was just saying uh, before we went on air, probably one of the most engaged I've been professionally. Because as I said, I, I came from, um, I started off in teaching in primary school and then went uh, into leadership within the secondary system. And during, in that system, I was um, serving uh, a reasonably disadvantaged community and lots of um, students that were needing re-engagement programs um, for school and um, out of home care type students and things like that. And um, anyone that's been through that sort of high trauma approach uh, would understand how much it takes to, to build that relationship with those students. And, um, you know, and uh, I, I had a number of students that um, were working on it uh, under this program. We finally convinced these kids, so let's give education a go. Let's, you know, these are about year nine, so 15 year olds round about. So right on that cusp of that very vulnerable age where we lose them to, uh, if they're not engaged in the education system. And uh, yeah, we, we would convince these students to have a go. And uh, then all of a sudden um, I would see that they couldn't spell or their reading was quite mm. low and, and all these sorts of things. And um, I was primary trained in the secondary sector. So my colleagues would say to me, well, you're primary trained. Why don't you just teach them how to read? Um, like, you know, it's probably <laughs> that's your bread and butter, you know? And, uh, and I realized that I was a lot more wanting in that area than, that, than I probably thought. Cause uh, you know, my original primary school students kind of looked like they just learned to read, you know? Uh, so um, I then moved to the to the primary sector where I took over at Bentley West Primary School, and uh, I had this sort of um, 
need to understand what does reading look like. And I was so fortunate to run mm. into Sarah Soam, who's probably been on this, uh, uh, um, I imagine. Um, yeah, she has. People would know, would yeah. know her. And I think she saw an opportunity here. She was working as a um, as an intervention uh, teacher at the time. And I, and I said, so what approach to reading do we have, particularly with intervention? Do we do reading recovery anymore? And, I, and she said, no, 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 this is... Um, so I sat and I watched <laughs> some watched some um, some structured literacy, what I now know is, um, as as uh, structured literacy, and I was just amazed at what some of the students could do. But it was only happening in intervention. And it was only happening in in prep. So I basically mm. said, no, this is an area that I absolutely need to know about. And uh, I had a prep student come up to me one day, and and I said, what are you learning about? Uh, today and they said uh, the gentle Cindy rule I said what's the gentle Cindy rule and they said don't you know just the fact that a, a Kurt makes a sound when it's followed by <laughs> and uh, so I just got schooled by a five-year-old so I I needed to understand um, a lot more about this I was very embarrassed as a as a teacher that had been in um, the education system that I didn't know um, how to teach a child how to read or, or spell or these sorts of things. So I went off and did some training um, in synthetic phonics. I, I really got to understand what the basic code and the complex code was. I got to understand that there's a big five of literacy. It's not just one component. It's a very, it mm. needs to be explicitly taught. It needs to be systematically taught. It's not something that kids just learn to do. It's, it's, uh, it, it, it needs to be, um, it's a biological secondary skill, meaning that, uh, you know, it needs to be taught. If you don't teach it, certain kids won't learn it. Mm. So, um, yeah, my whole uh, life got turned around right at that moment and uh, a lot of professional learning. I learned about the simple view of reading, um, you know, lots of these things that I'll talk about um, as we go on. But um, I would say um, what we've implemented is a, a structured uh, approach to literacy um, that addresses um, the big five, which is your, your oral language um, or big six, big five, depending on, on what you look at. So we've got our oral, ling our oral mm -hmm. language. Yeah, or well, big seven, I guess, if you throw executive function in. Executive functioning as well, <laughs> yeah. So these are the things. And um, when we analysed, um, we found that when you looked at uh, how did we teach decoding in particular, lots of our students were really struggling with spelling. They were really struggling with learning to read and they just weren't progressing. Um, and when we, lo we looked at uh, doing some um, phonics checks and how do you systematically teach um, phonemes and things like that, um, that, that was where I really started to see the students' levels go up to automaticity uh, and, and really um, fix that, what we call tier one teaching. We, we had good intervention. And what Sarah mm. was explaining to me that, yeah, I'll, I'll get these kids, re you know, reading to a certain level. I'll throw them back into the mainstream and they'll be back with me in six, six weeks' time. Yeah. So mm. um, we, we needed a whole school approach. And I suppose as the principal, I had the luxury of having the position <laughs> where I could start to, to focus on these things and uh, bring the whole school staff and community along with me and my learning um, and try and implement it uh, in the classroom. So... Um, it mm. changed from reading blocks, writing blocks to what does our oral language approach look like for five or 10 minutes? What does our um, phonics session look like? What does our phonemic mm. awareness, our approach to phonemic awareness? How do we measure and teach fluency? How do we build vocabulary systematically through the school? How do we um, then check on reading comprehension and all the components that go together to build background knowledge and all those sorts of things to bring to um, so yeah, a completely different way um, to, to teaching and a lot more explicit mm. approach. We used to have a bit more inquiry, yeah. Days, but, you know, um, yeah. So um, that's how it started, particularly with uh, initial reading instruction, and um, and we're still going. The the, the more mm. that we um, learn about, yeah. So 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 Steve, you've said one. Of, there's a, there's three things that I've picked up from what you've just said, and one is importance of us as school leaders or school leaders or those that are really wanting to influence um, the quality of instruction and outcomes within the school setting that we need to think about um, building our understanding of um, <clears throat> the pipeline of explicit and quality delivery through the educational years so you started by saying that initially when you first came to Bentley West um, there was already um, 
sort of a structured literacy type approach in year one and then students were going out to tier two and tier three to CERA um, but because there was sort of that gap potentially from year two um, right up to um, you got to year six yeah 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 so for those remaining years that tier one instruction at that point in time wasn't in place so you very quickly recognized the need for I'm going to say some really clear strategic leadership to ensure that you definitely had that quality tier one instruction all the way from year one to six correct absolutely because what the data was showing Carla was that uh the the need for learning support was growing not diminishing as the kids went through the years yeah we had to ask mm. why and once you start understanding the vocabulary explosion that happens in most schools about grade three where you know uh, you've got history learning coming online geography all these mm. rich words and if the students don't have decoding strategies and and ways of learning multisyllabic words that are that and are not known to them they can fall backwards very very quickly um so mm. we were noticing that students weren't having that accumulative uh Mm. throughout the school let alone you know uh, you know in, in an individual year so what we found was if we got back and really focused on those decoding skills early not 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 ignoring language comprehension and it, it, kids mm. still need to be exposed to rich text they still need yes. to be uh, you know connecting those things but just 15 to 20 minutes a day three phone names you know all that really teaching that complex code making sure that spelling was, we found that the gap between our bottom students and our top students started to, um, to narrow. So we didn't mm, have... Brilliant. Yeah, we didn't have issues in grade three and four where I needed 20 more um, in learning intervention teachers because the wheels had fallen <laughs> off at grade three and grade four. And we know what the research says, that it mm. costs four times as long and four times yeah, as Yeah, four times. Intervene. So get in early, early, early. Mm. So we had to prioritise prep to one, yeah, initial reading instruction, make sure we got that absolutely mm. right to start with, um, really focused our interventions mm. there. And then uh, now that we're six or seven years, um, I think we're coming up to my eighth year, actually, eight, eight year in, we don't see wow. that need. We've got our four or five percent of kids that might have dyslexia and will always need mm -hmm. some sort of tier two <coughs> support, but we don't have um, the same need to intervene in the older years because mm. a lot of the problems have been ironed out earlier. That has saved me money. It saved me behavioural issues. It saved me self-esteem issues, mm. well-being issues, welfare issues. Yeah. So, um, it really is worthwhile um, in, in, as a school leadership, um, you know, to get those best outcomes for the kids. And when you think about um, the quality of um, professional capability that you must have on your staff, it must be pretty up there because, you know, what you will have um, potentially experienced when you first came to Bentley West some eight years ago was pockets of brilliance or pocket, what I call pockets of promise in different parts of the school. But because you've taken that real strategic approach to building a quality pipeline of education through the years, you've really kind of raised the bar. And I imagine that as a result of that, um, you'll have teachers that feel more knowledgeable, that have a lot more confidence in what they're teaching and how they're teaching. The over the teacups dialogue that goes on in your staff room will be at a much higher level because your teachers are really knowledgeable and so much more capable due to you having um, implemented, I'm going to say, a whole school quality approach. Mm. It's it's funny you should say that, Carla. It's um uh, I got a email from one of our teachers that said thank you for giving the profession back. Um, wow! Because, because not only does that build that confidence and that connection, there was a, a whole school consistent approach. Uh, we had a viable curriculum. All these data mm. points started to improve. Um, but the the conversation with parents. So every person at our school um, over the years. This wasn't a quick a quick fix, by the way. It was really <laughs> yeah. really invested in teacher training is trained to the level of understanding to be able to deal with a tier three student. So all of a sudden mm. that anxiety about what do I do with this child? What do I do in this situation? Starts to melt away because the student, the teachers have the knowledge and the skills. Yeah. Um, and then that yeah. transfers to their ability to be able to communicate to parents, communicate to the students. The parents are happier. The kids are going home, telling them about spelling rules and words and understandings about morphology and things that, that parents didn't mm. even know about. So all of a sudden, the, the respect for the teachers 
is really, really high. Um, mm-hmm. at the trust, the, the professional trust that we have, yeah. with, not only with each other, but with the school community and other people that come to visit Bentley West uh, um, is, is uh, very impressive and I think very motivating because every teacher that I've ever met only wants their students to get better. Absolutely. And when they see that happening right before their very eyes, um, and I see it myself, uh, I got to, um, I trained uh, in all the, all the, everything that the, um, the teachers have trained in and I even uh, made sure that I pulled out some of the students and, and had some kids with intervention and I was teaching a child with dyslexia and they learn how to read. I've, I've never had a better experience in my life. Like it, it's just such a gift to be able to give that to mm, a child yeah. struggling and, mm. and see them grow before your very eyes. Like, and to do that on a mm. whole school, but we're, we're extremely proud. Um, our parents are extremely happy. We get good feedback um, most of the time. And uh, yeah, it, it's a really great point, Carla, that that's uh, professional trust, the motivation, to, to want to learn mm. more and do better is, is really there. We've got very highly engaged staff, which I'm very lucky to have. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I know we talked earlier about, you know, that feeling of, and I've been here myself as well, when um, as a school leader, when, you know, I was in charge of these students who had such diverse um, learning profiles, you could say, and ultimately teachers would um, come into my office and say, I really don't know how I'm going to help. Johnny to be able to learn to read I've tried everything that I have um, at my discretion to be able to implement and I actually didn't know at that point in time and then I've been fortunate like you to train in different um, training programs and approaches and have experience like you where you can teach those what may have been those students that may have been termed the really difficult students um, to learn to read and So, you know, when you think about um, what we were just talking about with those teachers and how they feel to be equipped with those skills is just, it's it's like you're giving them a gift. And I think Mm. that it ultimately helps us to have empathy with ourselves because would you agree that you first and foremost go through a little bit of anger and somewhat... um, I don't know, kind of grieving that, you know, you trained for all of those years and you were a leader for all of those years, but fundamentally, if I'm honest, we didn't really know how to teach kids to be literate, Steve. Oh, absolutely, Carla, particularly when uh, you're in charge of the most vulnerable students. And, you know, um, we know, you know, Pam Snow, um, we've worked with um, a lot and she's, you know, just a fantastic um, academic and, really comes from that passion of, um, you know, that uh, illiteracy, you know, um, illiteracy is a, is a uh, it, it's, it's a health crisis. So seeing what I saw mm. at some of the schools that, that I'm at and um, just the shame, the shame of students that look around yeah, and, you know, and you look back on your career and you say, I could have, if I had known more, I would have done more. I, I would have done more. Mm. And you do go through that Absolutely. And then it is, well, why, why, why why, why didn't I know about this? Why, why, why wasn't this presented to me? I didn't know there was another way. I didn't know. And, you know, so initial teacher education, I started to get mm-hmm. quite grumpy as well because I thought, you know, I was there for four years. What, you know, in doing a, um, a, a primary yeah. degree. Why wasn't it my bread and butter like my secondary colleagues said and, you know, that I knew what to do? But, you know, you've got to move on. You've got to say to yourself, um, and this is to any teacher and any leader out there, um, I know that everybody comes to that school with the best intention for students. So, you know, teachers and school leaders and that are just some of the, mm. the greatest people in the world. And, you know, we're here for people and we've got to forgive ourselves. And once we know better, we've got to do better. And, um, and as I said, the rewards yeah. are amazing so um i i highly uh highly recommend that you start researching have a look if you if you don't know anything about this stuff or you've just started the journey um it's a rabbit warren because you never you never end but uh gee it's, uh, it's <laughs> <hard off. laughs> yeah it is it is um so sort of picking up on what you said about doing better when you were when you were speaking earlier um you talked about um, the importance of becoming very specific in teaching. I'm going to say the various elements that might have that might sit within our literacy block. And you and you made particular mention of 
you know, really drilling down and understanding what is it that we're doing in our oral language teaching? What is it that we're doing in terms of building phonological and phonemic awareness? What is our approach to explicitly teaching spelling look like and vocabulary? And how do we measure and build reading fluency and comprehension? So um, for those people that are sort of um, starting out or just, you know, a year or two years, which would probably be the most common time frame here in New Zealand, mm-hmm. um, what would your advice be to them in terms of um, playing the long, slow game, I guess, in terms of building up those areas of um, expertise and explicit instruction in those areas? Yeah, well, um, people have probably already noticed if they're one or two years in that uh, it, it becomes um, a, a initial reading instruction um, type area, and then but you might have uh, similar issues in the, in the upper school as well. Um, so where we began mm. uh, to pull this apart was we clearly identified decoding skills were where we were most probably uh, barren in our understanding of how to teach that and what that should look like. Um, we, we got some synthetic phonics sort of training and, and all those sorts of things. And we decided to start on spelling because once you learn about synth- synthetic mm-hmm. phonics, you know, the mm-hmm. encoding, and decoding, they go together. So if you're learning to spell, you do learn those sorts of things. So we were able to have a bit of a whole school approach because, um, you know, it was quite funny at one stage, our grade twos that might've been exposed to this systematic instruction were probably ahead of our grade fours and grade fives and grade sixes in their knowledge yeah. of, uh, of uh, yeah. what was happening. Uh, so um, yeah, I, I, I highly, um, highly encourage to, read widely and, and, and have a plan down d- down the track of where you want to go with this, but start small and do something well first, get, get your head mm. around that, celebrate that success. Um, that's, that's the way that uh, we sort of went about it. And then we sort of looked at some of the common elements that were, were really successful that are supported by other educational research. And we spoke about mathematics earlier and everything mm. kind of transferred over. It said, okay, so we started with spelling, which, Lent, lent itself to uh, the the forty four phonemes in a in a scope of which ones were we use the you know the most common and teach those ones first. And it doesn't mean you don't expose kids to other words and all this sort of stuff. But we you know we know that each mm. child is going to be systematically taught, and, and if the kids that can already read it improves their spelling as well. So we're not hurting anyone. We're not um, we're not uh, wasting anyone's time really. Um, but what were the common elements that were that were? Uh, it was a really well sequenced curriculum. It was a really clear understanding about what explicit teaching was. So a learning intention, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. the concept and skill development, you know, a review before uh, each of those lessons. So, yes. so that was yeah. really, really important. Um, and then your assessment tools to work out um, what was going on. You know, can the child, you know, uh, name this order? Not only after that lesson, after the next lesson and maybe in three weeks time. So really sort of designing uh, those sorts of things. So we just took that tiny little strand of um you know what a good sequence curriculum look like in terms of the 44 phonemes um and then said well this could be good for everything that we do so let's do that for morphology as well let's do that mm-hmm. for our maths instruction let's do that so we started to um slowly increment and build each year um and then we said well if we're going to prioritize this, what does a lesson, let's take the cognitive load off our teachers because they have to normally interpret the curriculum, develop the resources. So Absolutely. We, so we broke down the lesson for them. Teach this here, teach this mm. here, teach this here and started developing some of the materials for them with some of our more expert teachers. So they could just focus on trying to get through these lessons and trying to get better and um, you know uh, become automatic in the lesson structure and the mm. material now seven years down the track that's yeah more for them now they're so creative with that they know yes students are doing they can tell you exactly what student is saying mm. something not saying so i'm just i'm just they, they are way way beyond i could ever be now because they practice every day and so i would say mm-hmm. look it might look clunky it might look boring the pace might not be right but Persist, 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 persist. <laughs> it'll get there and the yeah. creativity and the and the fun um starts to really roll from the teachers and the kids mm. are, are highly engaged yeah yeah no I definitely agree about um I think what I interpret from what you said is it and I always lift up both of my arms when I talk about this it's quite strange but 
I see that there's like two roads that teachers have to become well traveled in. And one road is that where they know that lesson sequence road off, you know, just they could close their eyes pretty much and drive that road because it's just so automatic. And then the other is all the content knowledge. You know, if we're thinking about um, when we teach spelling, um, that they know those concepts and they've got everything down pat. Whereas the first time they come to teaching those things, they've got to learn the lesson sequence and practice that. And then if we layer a new content on top of that, whoa, it feels really shaky and somewhat awkward. So, um it's, yeah, it's, we've got to be somewhat forgiving of ourselves as we learn through that. A hundred percent. And I found being a, a model in that situation really helped because I, as I said, I was going through the training in that as well. And I love to be able mm. to get into a stuff and go, I planned a 45 minute, minute lesson and I only, I didn't even get through the sound pack. You know, I was losing cards. They were all over the yeah. shot. <laughs> you know, making a joke and making it okay that we are going to fail. Yeah. This is going to be terrible at mm. times, but we're on a journey. We're trying to get better. We're, you yes. know, there was a physical element of actually, you know, I'm doing this, the flashcards if uh, people aren't uh, seeing me. Um, yeah. There's there's a whole lot to integrate into teaching, and I, I would I would say my advice is um as a as a school leader is yeah be really um I kept saying how brave everyone was how brave people were to give this a go and put mm. themselves out there and be vulnerable again and mm. uh, but for the betterment of the kids absolutely and their literacy literally saving some students' lives as we know how important that transition to reading is. Mm. Yeah. One of the other things that I picked up from something you said earlier was ultimately that I think that due to potentially our um, um, pre, pre-service teacher training or initial teacher training, that we didn't really completely understand and or value due to that lack of understanding the very strong connection between spelling and reading. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. A hundred. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so where we... Yeah. Yeah, uh, and uh, that, that's where once you start uh, really reading um, about the research, that's you know one of the most research skill ever, and you start getting into orthographic mapping and um, mm. you know the the dual root theory and all these sorts of things. As I said, you can really go down, and um, more and more that you read the research, the more and more confident you can feel what you're doing in your school is the right thing. And, you know, and some teachers will come along with you on that research journey and want to go down and read, read to that level. And other people will just say, just show me what to do. And I'm, I trust you. And I'm, I'm happy to do that. Yeah. So, getting on, so getting people on board, um, I think, um, wasn't as hard as what I thought, because people felt themselves um, being knowing what to do. There was something to work on. Uh, the students were getting better. The parents were very supportive because their kids were coming home and saying things. Uh, so um, it it kind of started to snowball, um, and everyone wanted to be to be on board and, and learn these new things because I think um, with a lot of the change management is um, you know we went from running records to to not running records because we found we could get things mm. done in a screener. You know, a running record would would tell you something, but it would not tell you exactly why the child couldn't read or, or, or you know, or, or do all these sorts of things. So um, if I needed to know that the child had a decoding issue, well, what particular phonemes were they having issues with? What particular rules? What particular words? Mm. You know, all those sorts of things. Um, we just found it was so much better to, to do those quick screeners and, and work on our teaching rather than you know, uh, do six months worth of running records every five weeks and all these sorts of things. So there was a lot in it, and you know, a lot of discussions, a lot of, um, you know, uh, building the confidence to say, it's okay to question the things that you used to be taught. I know that they're a comfort for you. I know that uh, the last thing you want a principal doing is saying, don't tell me to take this away. This has worked for me for 20 years. Teaching scary is if if I can't control these kids, my day is hell. So don't please don't you dare take this stuff away from me. So I think that small incremental uh, approach and not overwhelming people um, is different for different people. You've always got your mavericks that want to go out there and try anything new tomorrow, and then you've got the other people that are that are so. So yeah, there was Mm. a little bit of a differentiated approach and and getting people on board as well. Um, uh, Yeah. Do you think do you think that your success to um, you know just ultimately your success at Bentley West is 
um, can be attributed to though the fact that you did take a whole school approach when you when you learned when you came in and you spent some time with Sarah and you had more of an understanding of what that sort of pipeline through education could look like. And I say that, Steve, because we have two sort of uptake models here here in New Zealand of implementing a more structured approach to literacy and albeit um, beginning in mathematics. And that is where we have whole schools or principals who lead through and implement that change process. And then we do have teachers who are the Lone Ranger in their school and I know they feel really isolated in, in what they're doing. So um, I think it's important that we acknowledge probably the, the difference for, in yeah. terms of what people experience. And I'm just interested, you know, in the colleagues that you've talked to, I know that you have a you have a, a large number of colleagues in Melbourne who are sort of on the same track as, as you are. And then I'm sure that there are colleagues that you have that aren't on that same track to the degree yeah. or if at all as to where you're at. So what would your advice be to those you know, those teachers, I guess, who are lone rangers and and all these just a few of them or a lone ranger leader who is trying yeah. to really um, coerce others, coerce their yeah. colleagues into being open to to the science of reading and the science of learning. Um, I, I would say don't give up and all you can control is what you can control and that's uh, what's happening within your four walls in your your classroom um, if you can do that and, and you are and uh, you know gather that data and show the improvement in in certain kids that will no doubt be there and then I I I challenge people to think about, well, imagine you got that improvement and growth and collective responsibility for your students learning on a prep to six, uh, you know, cycle. So um, we talk a lot about collective mm. responsibility here and that our data is all of our data. And, uh, you know, if something's gone wrong at grade three or grade five, that's, that's all of our responsibility up to there, including mine. Like, have we designed the curriculum properly? Have we done this? So if you don't have your heroes down in prep looking at the, the, the grip of the handwriting, teaching those basic skills first and all that, all those sorts of things. Um, I think sometimes w with all good intentions, we want to jump to the high level stuff early and we don't d use the team approach. So if we really want the students mm -hmm. to be doing high level comprehension type work and, you know, um, you know, responding with amazing pieces of writing. We need someone to do the, the groundwork to it so the kids don't have to think about that stuff, that they've got amazing spelling and handwriting and, the, and they can read the words and all those sorts of things. So the cumulative effect and everyone being acknowledged for their role mm. in that journey as a team, and it's not just one particular teacher, it's a group of teachers. So all you can do is uh, your 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 best and show that growth improvement and then then I think start to present well imagine we didn't have to start from scratch year in year out and we could be confident that the students would come mm. with these particular um, I use maths as, a, as an example like the times tables like you know teaching percentages and things like that imagine teaching grade three and you can be confident that every child knows their their times tables and, yeah. then, and if every child doesn't know their times tables, they've got a method of being able to, to, to access that information anyway. We call it the floors, no ceilings approach. So there's your baseline to work from mm. as a teacher. And then how exciting is it that you don't have to worry about or go back over those basic skills that should have been taught in the, in the, in the earlier years and you can springboard from the platform that the group of teachers that worked before you has given you. And that's what's inspiring to me, that together as a collective, uh, Absolutely. We, can, we can build. But yeah, as you said, the lone wolves out there, you can only control what you control and do the best for your kids at that particular time and show the data improvement that you can achieve in that 12 months. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Some really great languaging that you use there that I just want to repeat. One is the collective responsibility piece. Love that. I think that when we know how to communicate well and we can go into those meetings with that data to share with our colleagues and open up the discussion around, imagine what it would look like, um, to use your term, if we had a, cum a cumulative effect and we had that increase all the way instead of just that end of, you know, ambulance at the bottom of the cliff with that individual teacher um, and the fact that it's a team effort and, and the floors, no ceilings approach. 
Amazing. That's what we want for every child and actually every teacher, right? We want every teacher to know how to um, to implement that flaws, no ceilings approach um, so that so that our students can keep climbing. So um, let's kind of come to our um, our last couple of questions. One question is this, is that what do you now that you know everything that you know? What what is the risk to your students or what would have been the risk to your students if you hadn't implemented all of the great work that you have over the last, particularly the last um, five or six years? Yeah. Well, the research you know, clearly shows, um, Carla, and, I, and I, I've seen it with my own eyes, um, you know, and it's hard not to get emotional about it, that uh, the risk is that the child thinks that there's something wrong with them. And uh, they won't learn to read. They simply won't. There's a percentage of students, you know, uh, that, that just won't pick this up. They, they won't pick it up without the explicit mm. um, instruction. They, they just won't. And it's too much of a risk. It's, it's too literacy or numeracy. We just know the outcomes for these kids. Uh, you know, I was, I was uh, briefly talking about Pamela Snow before, and she talks about it being a health crisis because those kids are overrepresented in juvenile justice. They're overrepresented with mental health um, mm. issues. They're overrepresented. So, to see a, a child come to school day one with their their school uniform on, so passionate and so keen to learn, and then slowly just see that ebb out them and say, maybe this place isn't for me because all of these other kids seem to pick it up and I don't. Um, you know, Nancy Young's reading ladder, I think mm. I encourage anyone to go and have a look at that and, and just say it is, you know, what, what is it? Um, I can't remember. I always get this wrong, but uh, um, uh, necess- was it necessary <laughs> for some or, uh, you know, harmful to none? There's just, there's no downside to this. It's, it's um, necessary for all, crucial for some. Um, mm. Yeah, that's right. And um, I've just learned that more and more and more. And uh, to see um, high school students um, work with a reading intervention teacher that's been t- trained in the science of leading to finally say, oh, someone knows my secret. Someone knows I don't know. And, they, mm. and they're going to help me. Mm. I've seen year 10 kids rock up mm. before school to get this help. It's just the best thing you can do. And and if if we don't do it, some students just don't get there and the life outcomes for them it's in the research i don't need to harp on it anymore it's it's not good and none yeah. of us none of us teachers want that for our kids no no one does no certainly not it's been amazing to hear your pearls of wisdom many of which i have written scribbled down on my piece of paper this afternoon um and I know that many of our listeners will be listening in and just, you know, what I think is so great about um, people like you giving your time to spend some time with me in these chit chats is that it's really energizing for people out there who are working in the space, Stephen. So I really want to thank you for giving your time this afternoon to, to motivate and continue to um, inspire people here in New Zealand. And I'm sure people from over the ditch um, yeah. uh, will be watching and listening as well. So as we sort of close off, what would be your closing statement for those people who are potentially thinking about or beginning to implement um, a structured or an evidence-based approach, say in literacy and or mathematics, because I know that you and your team have expertise in both. Um, what would be your sort of one or two key pieces of advice for them? Uh, yeah, first of all, congratulations for, um, you know, starting to really uh, open your eyes up to um, that there might be a, a different way. It's always a bit confronting. Um, and I would just say, uh, keep going, reach out. There's more and more people out there that are that are starting to do this. So all my fantastic colleagues in, in Western Australia, Lorraine Hammond's just an absolute star you know um we we, we put the mm-hmm. message out to her and we went and looked at some amazing schools in wa we've got lots of schools in victoria um down the same journey there's so many um uh, avenues to get this information now and see it in practice i encourage you to do the research do the reading but try and get somewhere and have a look at what it looks like um have a look there's there's plenty of places around at the moment. I know my colleagues in South mm. Australia, uh, Tasmania. There's lots and lots of schools that have uh, that have gone down this journey. 
and it and it's quite helpful to see di different people along different paths. So you see someone that's eight or ten years down the track versus two years, um, and and just keep going. And thank you for being so brave. Um, I just know that this will be the best thing that you do professionally, and um, the hard work's worth it. Mm, completely agree. And and um, what's really exciting for me to share with you, Stephen, is that we have some schools here in New Zealand now that are pretty much have become our flagship schools in different parts of the of the country for people to be to be able to go and visit as well. So um and I think I'm just thinking back to because you know we had our tour group organized of 25 teachers I think we were bringing to Bentley West when the very first COVID outbreak happened. Right. Some of whom were actually together. sitting some of whom yeah, yeah, some of whom were sitting in the um, in the departure lounge at the airport, and um, and I think Sarah called me and said, "Oh my goodness, we've got COVID in Melbourne. You can't come." And um, so yeah, we we're really hopeful that we will get a New Zealand crew of school leaders um, across over to see you in action um, in in the very very near future. Because um, I agree, you know, people need to see what this looks like and see it in action, and they need to hear the vibe in your place too and experience um, how knowledgeable your teachers are and other teachers and other schools that are implementing um, this incredible structured and evidence-based approach. So thank you so much for joining uh, me this afternoon. Thank you to everybody out there who has given up some of their time this afternoon, most likely in your school holidays. Um, our next chit chat is coming up actually in just a couple of weeks and I'm going to be joined by Katie Tompkins, who is really well known here in New Zealand for implementing structured literacy in a secondary school setting. So um, keep an eye out for that. But um, thank, thanks so much for your time, Stephen. It's been really, really wonderful to chat with you this afternoon. Uh, thank you. And I, I hope I wasn't too chaotic. Thanks so much. I'll see you, see you later. <laughs> <No>. <laughs>